So listen to this. People say all kinds of crazy things about Pele, but there are two of them that completely set me off. First is when they say, he didn't really score a thousand goals, he was counting the goals he scored in his backyard. And then there's also the ones who say, who cares if he won three World Cups, he wasn't even the best player in any of the three tournaments. Come on, if any of this was true, then why would players like Platini, Puskas, Di Stefano and Beckenbauer claim that he was not only the greatest player of all time, but also the most complete player they ever saw? Well, let's go over that first claim, as it is by far the most controversial. If you ask Pele or anyone in Brazil, they'll tell you he scored 1,282 goals in his career across 1,363 matches. But if you ask FIFA, they'll claim he scored just 757 goals in 812 matches. But obviously, he didn't just imagine these matches in his head, it's a matter of whether or not they fulfill every requirement of what FIFA calls an official match, and 551 of them don't. But the thing is, questioning their legitimacy is wrong, since a deeper analysis shows that not every legitimate goal was official, and not every official goal was legitimate. What many assume is that there was something wrong with his unofficial matches, that Pele must have been playing with kids or complete amateurs, but in reality, that wasn't the case at all. Some of these matches were among the most competitive he ever took part in. The thing is, 471 of those 551 were considered friendlies. But why was Pele playing so many friendlies? Well, the answer to that goes deeper than anyone could possibly imagine at first. To fully understand why, you gotta understand the political climate Brazil was in back then, and how Pele was literally imprisoned in his own country, forbidden from ever leaving. But before I explain all of that, let me tell you about the real GOAT, the GOAT of YouTube sponsorships, Raid Shadow Legends. Over the last few years, Raid has completely taken over. How could they not? They're like a console game on your phone. The game seems pretty much infinite, just champions, there's 600 of them, and they're so cool I couldn't even pick just one. I've been moving back and forth from playing with Cardiel, who looks like this angelic warrior, and Glicea Soul Guy. I mean, she can literally freeze the entire enemy team, that's not just epic, it's also pretty hilarious. There has never been a better time to start playing. Raid is running an Halloween promotion for new players and you can win real-life prizes like $1,000 Amazon gift cards, which is crazy considering the game is completely free. All you need for this is to create an account and then head to trickortreat.plarium.com and there you just put your details, spin the wheel and get your prize, but don't wait too long because this all ends on November the 5th. There's also a specific offer for viewers of this channel. If you're a new player, click my link in the description over the next 30 days and you can get unique bonuses worth $30. You get a free champion Verges, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost and 1 ancient shard. And all of this treasure will be waiting for you here once you click the link in the description, so let's get back to the video. People always ask why didn't Pele ever leave? Why did he stay in Brazil playing with amateurs? First of all, back in the 1950s, South American football was arguably stronger than European football. From the 50s to the 70s, eight World Cups were played, five were won by South American national teams, and the same applied to clubs. 18 international cups were played, and South American teams won 10 of them. And it made sense. It was a time when intercontinental transfers were still rare, which meant despite all the money in Europe, 99% of Brazilian players stayed in Brazil for most of their careers. Just picture how the Brazilian champion would be today with Neymar, Coutinho, Vinicius Jr, Casemiro, Firmino, Gabriel Jesus, everyone. Suddenly things would look much different and that's how it was back then. In fact, many argue Santos didn't even have the best team in the league. That if it weren't for Pele, it would have been Botafogo that would have dominated that era with players like Didi, Garrincha, Jairzinho, etc. Pretty much all the other star players who made it possible for Brazil to win those three World Cups, which we'll talk about later. Still, I have to say, none of that was enough to stop Pele from wanting a move to Europe. No matter how good Santos was, the money over in Europe was different, the opportunities were too tempting. At 17, Pele finished the season with 66 goals in 46 matches and with all the clubs lusting over him, it became apparent from very early that Pele would eventually leave and no one wanted that, not even the government. So, the solution they found was simple. The moment he turned 18, he was called up for mandatory military 
Army's service. He was already a World Cup winner by then, but they didn't care. Not only did this move force him to stay in Brazil, but it served as a way to increase the prestige of the Brazilian Army, making it more appealing for the young men who followed him, which in return made it so that there were less deserters and revolutionaries. Once there, Pele was also made to play in the Coast Guard and Army football teams, goals which he counted towards his tally, despite them being clearly not the most legitimate. However, even using this to slander him isn't fair, given that he only played 10 matches with his team, scoring 14 goals, which would barely make a dent in his record of over 1200 goals. The same applies to the goals he scored in other minor exhibition matches, may it have been the Paulista regional team or the Santos and Vasco All-Star squads, as overall those matches amounted to only 20 more goals. Still, I know what you're thinking, why didn't he leave once his military service was over? Well, by 1961 he was indeed completely free and the clubs were coming one after the other, but even when Inter put down a 1 million pound bid for the player, Santos rejected it anyway. Even though the transfer record had just been broken that year at only 152,000 pounds, and despite the fact that the 1 million pound mark would only be broken 15 years later. Pele himself has told the press that even Juventus were so desperate to buy him that their owners, the Agnelli family, offered them a share of their own company. You might know them. Fiat, the $31 billion car company. Yeah, the government was getting desperate. Janu Quadros, the president at the time, was hanging by a string. He had taken over after an anti-corruption campaign, but then he forced his own conservative beliefs onto the public, even banning bikinis in Brazil. I don't even think I need to explain why people didn't like that one, huh? After that, he knew that if he allowed Pele to leave, his public image would hit rock bottom, probably forcing him to step down as president. And so, he pulled off a crazy stunt, creating a bill that named Pele as a literal national treasure. He wasn't just trying to compliment him or something, no. Now being treated as pretty much an object, Pele did not have the right to leave the country without his permission. As incredible as that may sound, it wasn't even the only case at the time. Similar things were done to both Eusebio and Puskas. And here's where the friendlies come in. By 1963, Pele had won the Libertadores twice, the Intercontinental Cup twice, the Brazilian Cup three times, and the Paulista Championship five times, being the star player and top scorer in pretty much every tournament, which meant he had nothing else to fight for in Brazil. He was hungry for a new challenge, but he couldn't leave, so as they say, if Mohamed won't come to the mountain, then bring the mountain to Mohamed. With Pele daydreaming of facing all the European greats and Santos aware they could profit immensely from taking the most famous man in the world on tour, that's exactly what they did, but things escalated. After a few years this had become so profitable that Santos literally rejected all opportunities to play at the Copa Libertadores in favor of going on yet another tour, which meant Pele would play his last ever Copa Libertadores at the age of just 24. The same happened with the Copa America, rejecting every call-up from there on out and playing his last tournament, and only tournament, at the age of 18. So yeah, the next time you see someone questioning why he only played 3 Libertadores and only 1 Copa America, it obviously wasn't because he couldn't qualify or something like that. This whole deal is the reason why, despite never playing in Europe, Pele managed to face European teams on 130 different occasions. And since I can feel you asking already, across those 130 matches, he scored 144 goals. It would be insane to question whether Pele could have done it in Europe, even if you narrowed it down to only the biggest names in the continent. Somehow his average only goes up and don't think for a second they were going easy on him. Everyone wanted the bragging rights of having defeated Pele. Everywhere he went in Europe, the attendance record would be destroyed. Just imagine the only time he ever faced Real, their team took over a week of rest before the match, knowing Santos was on tour and would be playing 19 matches in just 39 days, which of course, meant they were able to defeat them, though they did not stop Pele from scoring and a week later, Pele took revenge playing Barcelona, Inter and Valencia in the same week and scoring 7 goals across those 3 matches. In fact, around that time, Pele hit his highest tally ever, scoring 126 goals in a calendar year, which wasn't even that incredible for him as he broke the 100 goal mark 3 times in his career.
Still, it should be noted that if he were to take friendlies into consideration, Pele would not be the highest goal scorer of all time regardless. It would only be ninth, behind the likes of Puskas, Ger Müller and Josef Pican. By now you probably get what I mean when I say that official goals and legitimate goals were not the same thing, but my point is, even when people talk about official goals only, they find another thousand ways to discredit Pele. I hear people all the time claiming that back in his era they played with no offside rule and they believe this 100%. But it just isn't the truth. The offside rule was introduced in 1925, 15 years before Pele was even born, and back then it was even more restrictive. The attacker needed at least two players in front of him to be onside, instead of just one like today. In fact, that wasn't the only thing that made it much more difficult to score back then. Defenders were much more aggressive and referees did not look out for the attackers. I found one newspaper article saying Pele was the most fouled player in the 1959 Copa America, being fouled nearly 17 times per 90 minutes played. Nowadays, the most fouled player in Europe is João Félix, who doesn't even get fouled 5 times per 90 minutes. During my research for this video I found many incredible things, but what impressed me the most was a massive spreadsheet detailing every official match Pele had ever played. Just the fact that so many people have come together to look for newspaper scraps in order to determine every result, goal and assist he ever got is already a testimony to his greatness and analyzing it is a mind-blowing experience, because even if you focus only on official matches, his records are from another world. He totaled 355 assists, which goes to show he was much more than just a goal scorer. People forget he wasn't even really a pure striker. At Santos, Coutinho was the one up front, Pele played more as a number 10, at most a secondary striker role. Even in the World Cup he totaled 8 assists over his career, only Maradona can claim to have done the same and he played 7 more World Cup matches than Pele and this did not stop him from getting 86 career hat-tricks, 28 pokers, as well as 180 in headers and once scoring in 20 consecutive matches or even from getting 36 goals and assists in the best 10 match period of his career. Which reminds me of a story. If there was one competition he played that at times clearly wasn't up to the European standard, it was the Paulista Championship. Every year there were a few teams that just weren't even supposed to have a chance and one of those was Botafogo SP. The small one, not the Botafogo that had Garrincha and all of that. The thing is, in 1964 they shocked everyone by beating Santos 2-0 in a match Pele wasn't available for. They dominated them so much they even chanted Ole, but Pele Pele took offense to that and in the second round of the tournament, by the time he had come back, they played them again. By halftime, Pele had scored 5 goals, the commentators were literally saying he looked possessed. The other team striker approached him and said, what's wrong with you, can't you stop scoring goals? Pele replied, at your stadium you chanted Ole, now at my stadium you will pay the price. By the end, the result was 11-0, the guy who was working the scoreboard literally freaked out because the numbers ended at 9. Pele had scored 8 himself and assisted another, it was the only time in his career that he managed to score more than 5 goals. And the funny thing is that the other team's coach was sacked and then hired by Corinthians, who two weeks later lost 7-4 to, to Santos with Pele scoring 4 and assisting 2, meaning that coach was a victim to 18 goals in 2 weeks and Pele at his hand in 15 of them. But finally, my other point. People always say Pele was carried by his teammates at the World Cup or that he was never even the best player at any of the tournaments, and I get it. With 14 matches played and 3 World Cup titles, well, one trophy every 4 matches just sounds fake. But let's take a look at that. In 1958 he was still only 17 so he was left out of the squad for the first two matches before taking over and going on to score 6 goals and getting 2 assists in the remaining 4 matches. Still, by the time Brazil were champions you could check any publication at the time and see that DD is always referred to as the best player at the tournament. It seems any article that says Pele was better came 50 years later which stinks of revisionism. In 1962 the claims are pretty much just true. Pele got injured in the second match of the World Cup, having contributed only to one goal and one assist, nothing compared to Garrincha who was the top scorer and set the all-time record for most dribbles completed at a World Cup, nearly 13 per 90 minutes. This was followed by the 1966 World Cup which was a disaster for Pele, he was out on the group stage, injured, having only scored a single goal. 
Then, by his final World Cup in 1970, he put up maybe his best performance with 4 goals and 6 assists, contributing to a goal in every match and putting up his best performance in the final, but still, Jairzinho scored in every match, finishing as the competition's top scorer, which means it is not hard at all to find publications at the time who claim that Jairzinho was the one responsible for Brazil's success. This second argument is one I feel is much more credible. Though more than obviously Pele was one of the greatest World Cup players of all time, he could not have done all of this without an incredible squad behind him. Those three trophies were not Pele's achievement, they were the achievement of one of the most talented generations the world has ever seen. Regardless of that, Pele changed football forever, he was immensely talented, the kind of footballer that comes once every 50 years. Even the great Andy Warhol, who invented the term 15 minutes of fame, made sure to say, Pele has surely contradicted my theory, instead of 15 minutes of fame, I think he will have 15 centuries.